Well, it's uh, 1300 hours European time, 1200 in the UK, and it's uh, 7 a.m. in uh, the Eastern time in the US, and it's considerably later in the Philippines. We've got a really international event for you today, and I'd like to welcome you all wherever you're joining from, and uh, really thank you for sparing the time to be with us. This event marks the international launch of a briefing paper, and this is titled The Impact of Climate Change on Mental Health and Emotional Well-Being, Current Evidence and Implications for Policy and Practice. This briefing paper has been produced by the Imperial College's Institute of Global Health Innovation, as well as the Grantham Institute on climate change and the environment, which is also based at Imperial. And the event will explore the latest evidence and the actions needed to address the mental health impacts of the climate crisis. We'll draw upon expertise from across healthcare, policy and research, as well as from civil society from around the world. I just introduce myself to you briefly. Uh, I'm super lucky in that I'm co-director of the Institute for Global Health Innovation, uh, which was very much uh, involved in the development of this briefing paper. I'm also serving as strategic director of a Swiss-based social enterprise called 4SD, and this focuses on leadership for systems change. I serve as the World Health Organization Special Envoy on COVID-19. And in addition, I'm co-chair of the World Innovation Summit for Health Forum on climate change and health. Now, before we go into detail of the paper, we'd like to start with a quick poll so you can see who else is in your virtual room and we'd like you to take a few seconds to answer two questions that should be appearing on your screen now. The questions are designed to get an idea of which sectors are represented at the event today. And we'd also like to get some understanding of how aware you are of ways in which climate change can impact on people's mental well-being. So if you'd like to fill in the poll, that would be great. I'll do it myself as well. See how long it takes me. It's always difficult to decide which sector you're from, but I think that it's helpful if you can be as close as possible. And then I enjoy going to enjoy looking at your responses on your level of awareness. Now, while you're just finishing that, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we're going to run this event. First thing is it's being recorded. Now that's quite simply because we want to make sure that others can access it, especially if they're unable to join at this time today. Closed captions are available via the otter.ai tab. It's there on your screens. Uh, it's on mine, it's right down at the bottom next to reactions. And then I just want to add a couple of other things. Uh, and I want to be clear on this. The first of all, first of all, we're saying that all cameras have been automatically switched off. And then we're also going to uh, be having a panel discussion. And we'd like you to send questions for the panel discussion via the chat function. Please include your name and organization if you're happy to. There's no compulsion. And we're going to have a system for harvesting your questions and then presenting them to the panelists. Actually, I know some of you will want to just share comments. Please be as precise as you can, and that will help us. Please also tag us on social media. There are various hashtags as alpha uh, grantham dot IC or alpha imperial uh, underlined IGHI and alpha climate cares. Um, those tags are all on the top of the slide here. You can see them and don't hesitate to use them. It, it's so helpful. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists. 
Well, first of all, I'd like to in inform you that Dr. Emma Lawrence is the principal uh, researcher on this piece of work, and I'm really, really pleased to welcome her. She's Mental Health Innovations Fellow at the Institute of Global Health Innovation at Imperial College, but she's actually joining us today from Adelaide in Australia. Then we have Dr. Katie Hayes, Senior Policy Analyst on Climate Change and Innovation for Health Canada, and she's joining us from north of Toronto in Canada. Senna Salcedo is a mental health first responder at the St. Arnold Center for Integrate Integral Development in the Philippines. She's joining us from Quezon, just close to Manila. And then we have Clover Hogan, founder and executive director of Force of Nature, which operates internationally. Clover is joining us from London. We've joined by Jennifer Uchendo. Jennifer is someone I've worked with for many years. She's founder of Susti Vibes in Nigeria, and Jennifer joins us from Lagos. And then Dr. Gary Belkin is with us, founder of Billion Minds Institute and visiting scientist at the Harvard School of Public Health. And Gary joins us from New York. So you can see we have a truly international panel. Now let's go to the poll results. Let's see what they say. Are they going to come up? Here they are. What sector are you from? Well, we have 137 participants here today. 33% of us are from research. 15% of us are active in healthcare. 8% have roles in policy and government. 16% are from community organizations and civil society. 10%, one in 10, from business or industry. 2% are funders or involved in philanthropy. And then we have 15% who could not categorize themselves. That's not bad. I'm glad that we were able to provide categories that were meaningful to 85% of you. Now, now we come to this very interesting question. What's your level of awareness? 13% you know a lot. 31% you know a fair amount. I was in that category. 44% you know a little. Probably that's where we all should be because the whole thing is we often don't know what we don't know. And then 12% have said you know very little. Well, this is giving us the basis and we hope that by the end of this event and the panel that we'll all shift up a bit and be knowing a bit more. And now it's a great moment. It's our wonderful panel. And as you can see from the timetable, our next part is actually to ask Dr. Emma Lawrence, the lead in really the leader of this work to present an overview of the briefing paper. And after she's introduced the paper, then we'll ask the panelists to give their reflections. I'll ask them a few um, probing, uh, prompting questions, and they'll give us their, their reactions, and then we'll come to you. And so, Dr. Lawrence, I'd like you now to give us the overview. You have the floor. Many thanks, David. It's a real pleasure to present today a brief overview of the interconnections between climate change and mental health and some recommended responses from each sector, no matter which of those categories you picked. But first, I'm very happy to introduce Climate Cares, the climate change and mental health program behind this event, run by the Institute of Global Health Innovation and the Grantham Institute at Imperial College London. So we're a team of researchers, designers, policymakers, and educators working to better understand and respond to the climate crisis and the mental health impacts therein. So climate change is increasingly recognized as a health emergency, with the health of people and planet intertwined. But compared with the physical health aspects, the mental health impacts have been relatively neglected but as I'll discuss, are significant and will be increasingly widespread without action. It's 
important to highlight that the relationship we're talking about here today is bi-directional. So not only does climate change impact mental health and emotional well-being, but also the way we think and feel about climate change, i.e. the way we respond psychologically and emotionally to the crisis, has a big impact on how we act and how we can respond to this challenge as a society. Vitally, there are also unappreciated common causes to some of the burden of both mental health needs and a changing climate that arise from the way our societies currently operate. So for example, the negative impacts of air pollution. And this observation comes with a big opportunity because by taking action on climate, this will have even bigger returns than currently predicted, both by reducing the mental health impacts, but also by creating societal changes that are themselves strongly associated with improved mental health and well-being. But unfortunately, at the moment, both the costs of inaction and the benefits of action are not being accounted for in policy and planning. And we know that both knowledge and awareness is relatively low. So as an illustra illustration of this, you'll see on the left of the slide, uh, a search of um, academic journal database PubMed, where there was only 478 articles looking at both climate change and mental health in the last decade as opposed to thousands on each topic individually. And similarly, a search of the New York Times, which we take as a metric of awareness, shows only 257 articles looking at climate change and mental health connections, whereas there are, again, thousands on each issue individually. So to respond to this and raise awareness that we hope will drive action, we're really pleased today to launch internationally the, international, uh, the IGHI Grantham Institute briefing paper, the impacts of climate change on mental health and emotional well-being, current evidence and implications for policy and practice. This summarizes current evidence while providing recommendations for each sector to act. The next slide shows an example figure from the briefing paper and I recognize that this is very detailed and you can't see it all, but it gives an overview of how climate change impacts at the top of the figure ultimately impact mental health at the bottom of the figure through a variety of direct to indirect pathways forming this middle continuum. I'll now walk through this in more detail, but I wanted to present it all together to highlight the need to consider this as a whole system. But first to the climate impacts. So we know that as greenhouse gases increase in the atmosphere, there are a range of current and future climate impacts, including gradual changes in average climactic conditions, so rising temperatures and sea levels, more acute extreme weather events, e.g. more severe and floods and fires, and also more chronic extreme wet climate events, such as a drought. These climate change related events then influence mental health via numerous pathways, either directly or more indirectly. So we've highlighted a few examples here, such as loss and damage of homes and properties as one pathway, or direct experiences of extreme high temperatures, through to things like community breakdown, disruptions to health systems, or even more indirectly, being aware of or witnessing changes to homelands or learning about these climate threats. So all of these pathways ultimately impact on mental health and emotional well-being. And we know that those are broad terms, but here we're using them to capture impacts, including new cases of mental illness, increased numbers of suicides or suicidal thoughts, worsened physical health or death for people with pre-existing symptoms or diagnosis of mental illness, and worsening mental health and emotional well-being in the general population. And we know also there are certain groups who seem to be particularly affected. And this includes, for example, children and young people, the elderly, pregnant women, indigenous communities and poorer communities, and those with pre-existing mental illness diagnoses or experiences of severe distress. And hence climate change threatens to widen inequalities, including mental health inequalities. So to look at those impacts in a bit more detail, we know that rising local temperatures on both short and long timescales 
have been associated with more deaths by suicide. And while there's more to learn and this varies across settings, we see that as local daily temperatures get hotter by about one degree, so for about a one degree Celsius change from 30 degree day to a 31 degree day, we get around a 1% increase in number of suicides. So USA and Mexico alone, this would translate into about 22,000 extra suicides by 2050 without climate action. We also see with higher temperatures, more hospital attendances for symptoms of mental illness and severe distress. And we also see that people with pre-existing mental illness are more likely to experience physical heat distress with some estimates that they're two to three times more likely to die in a heat wave with both biological and social causes to this. We also see that there is more frequent and extreme weather events with climate change. In 2020 alone, we had Australian, Californian and Siberian wildfires, floods in Indonesia, Kenya, Uganda and Bangladesh, and typhoons and hurricanes in the Philippines and Somalia. And while all of these are associated with deaths, evacuations and migrations, we very often focus on this damage to homes or the number of deaths. But beyond physical injury, the psychological toll of these disasters is huge. And by some accounts can exceed the physical injury toll by 40 to one. It's understandable that there's short-term shock and trauma and that for some, this leads into longer-term severe distress and diagnoses of anxiety, depression, PTSD, substance abuse, and increased likelihood of suicide. So we need timely support, both material support to return life to normal as soon as possible, and also ongoing community and mental health support to reduce the likelihood of impacts. We also see that even when people don't directly experience these climate impacts, just being aware of or witnessing these events, seeing natural landscapes change and the future way of life threatened has a big psychological and emotional toll. And many people, particularly young people, and those whose livelihood or culture are strongly tied to the land, are feeling very strong emotions and distress, including grief and anxiety and guilt and anger. But it's important we don't pathologize these. And the new terms like eco-anxiety are not a new disorder, but we do need to understand how climate change is acting as a stressor and how we can support all of us individually and as societies to process these emotions in a healthy way and respond to the threat in a way that leads us and supports us in taking action. And this in itself can support well-being. Um, but of course, there are issues of burnout. And for some, climate change and the perceived government inaction is so distressing that it's impacting their sleep and lives and having a huge ongoing psychological toll. So all of these impacts described must be taken into account in policy and planning across the board in health and public health systems and emergency responses across both climate and health policies. But the good news here is that there are not just costs of inaction of climate change on mental health. There are also benefits of climate action that we haven't properly accounted for. We see that individual action can have benefits and government action can help relieve some of that distress associated with inaction in the face of the threat. But climate actions themselves that do things like increase active transport or promote natural flood defenses with increased biodiversity or reduced air pollution, these all have mental health wins. So there are opportunities here to reduce inequality and improve mental health while we mitigate and adapt to climate change. So we can move here from a vicious to a virtuous cycle with the right holistic approach. We need a systems level holistic response across all of our community systems to a systems level challenge. We need to bring together different sectors to work together and learn from good examples of change around the world. So to help with this as a first or one of many um, helping in this space, we've highlighted recommendations for several sectors, including health system leaders and healthcare practitioners, policymakers, researchers and funders, and third sector and community organizations. And two recommendations were pulled out here from the report for all sectors to advocate for climate mitigation and adaptation that uses the mental health impacts as part of the rationale. 
and also for all sectors and organizations to consider facilitating or joining cross-sector, cross-organizational collaborations. We're also highlighting that health system leaders and practitioners can train healthcare workers to identify, manage and speak out about these impacts. That policymakers can ensure that these co-benefits for climate action on mental health are adequately incorporated into cost benefit calculations across both climate and mental health policies. That researchers can fund and conduct robust interdisciplinary and collaborative research. And we've highlighted a few key research area needs, one of which is to um, better look at the economic burden so we can take that into account in cost benefit calculations. And finally, for third sector and community organizations to ensure that those responding um, in the face of uh, an extreme weather event um, or heat also know about these links and are poised to provide the right support. So many thanks. Uh, we hope you read the briefing paper and I really look forward to exploring these ideas more in the panel discussion. I'll hand that to you, David. Yes, Emma, that was lovely because I think uh, certainly listening to you uh, go through this very clear presentation, it, it really does help us now to get into the briefing paper and really absorb the very valuable information in there. Because as I read the briefing paper, Emma, the, the sensation I get is that climate change is already having significant impacts on people's mental health and emotional well-being, really, and particularly uh, following the uh, higher temperature and extreme weather, weather events. There's a lot of distress associated with that. And, and these impacts tend to be hidden. You, you really brought it out, I think, that it's an invisible challenge uh, and uh, that it, these challenges exacerbate inequalities. Poorer people just get it much worse and, and it can get worse still without action because the situation is becoming more and more serious over time. But your message is also one of hope. There are important opportunities for improving people's mental health and well-being through climate action, that that can contribute to healthier, fairer societies for people and also for the planet. But to do this, we need collaboration, which is why it's so great to see so many people here today from around the world. And thank you for your recommendations, which are directly uh, designed for people with particularly important roles in the response. So thank you again, Emma. And now I'm going to hear, or we're all going to hear, how your opening remarks and reflections actually come across to the members of our panel. And so I'd like to go first to Dr. Katie Hayes. Could you please now share your remarks? And if it's OK, about three minutes, please, Katie. Over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to comment, especially on this wonderful briefing paper. So firstly, as highlighted in the briefing paper, there's a real need to consider the mental health effects equally alongside the physical health impacts of climate change. Too often mental health effects are often overlooked and there's real important consequences as Emma has provided in her slide deck. Integrating mental health into climate change and health assessments is a real critical step to understanding the full extent of the health consequences of climate change and um, also to assess adaptation opportunities. Secondly, as noted in the briefing paper, there are hidden costs to policymakers of climate inaction for mental health, including increased strain on health systems that are already overburdened. So there's a real need for improved physical and financial access to care. And further, when we're considering access to care, it's important to note that mental health care may mean different things to different people. It may mean formal care by a mental health professional. It may mean community-based care. It may mean enhancing social capital or a sense of belonging or increased access to land-based activities. And thirdly, from a policy and practice perspective, it's important to consider and highlight that climate change is a threat multiplier disproportionately affecting those who are already experiencing health inequities based on age, gender, socioeconomic status, pre-existing condition, et cetera. 
And the implications for policy and practice is to really to improve mental health in a changing climate, we need to do so by really embedding health equity and social justice through the fabric of the planning, the practice and policy implementation. And finally, it's important to learn from and with those who are on the front line experiencing the mental health effects of climate change, to learn what mitigation and adaptation means to them, to learn what types of culturally relevant mental health care are needed, how and by whom care should be delivered, and emphasizing who should be leading these initiatives to reduce social inequities. So thank you so much for the opportunity to um, speak, and I hope I was under the three minute mark. Thanks Not so only were you under the three minute mark, but thank you for your extraordinary clarity and in particular for stressing how uh, mental health needs to be equally considered alongside the physical health impacts of cli climate exchange as a parity of esteem and in particular for focusing on the hidden costs of climate inaction for mental health, while the real value of appropriate targeted climate policies, uh, especially with the way in which they can benefit both the individual mental health and the well-being of communities. Uh, again, thank you, Katie, for your consistent leadership uh, in this area. And now we'd like to move to Sena Salcedo, uh, mental health first responder, as I said, from the Philippines. And uh, Sena, you have three minutes starting now. Hi, hello everyone. I'm a psychologist and mental health first responder here in the Philippines. On our own capacity, we help individuals and community with mental health needs, usually after natural calamities. This paper is thought provoking. It gave me some chills resonating from horrible personal experiences from our country. I was scared by the data that it presents and hopeful that we can still do something about this and now is the right time to take persuasive action for mitigation. Last year, in the middle of the night, I responded to an anxious client 30 kilometers away from my location who sent me photos of wounded wrist and a message of, I can't take this anymore. That time, Metro Manila is on lockdown due to COVID-19 pandemic. At the same time, rain starts to pour and three typhoons are on cue in the Philippine Sea. Lucky enough, I was able to contact my client's closest friends who lives nearby and ask them to see my client immediately. They got there on time and was able to save my client's life from imminent danger. There are stories like this which are not responded to, maybe forgotten or continue to suffer in silence. Philippines has always been a favorite place of catastrophic typhoons, causing floods that would last for months and years of devastation. This is so stressful for most of us and traumatic for some. Every disaster, medical and physiological needs are provided first as part of the standard response. But not always psychological aid was required. Private organizations and individuals are the first to initiate this kind of support. They say we are used to this anyway. It is part of living here. But the effect of climate change to mental health is a subtle foe lurking in our minds, destroying our lives before we know it. With this paper, it would help us lobby causes that highlight climate change and mental health to encourage more people to be part of the awareness campaign and to participate in training and collaboration activities in their barangay and local communities. The recommendation alone are effective ways on how we can start an interagency team in taking actions instead of working in silos. I felt that this paper speaks through us, David. So thank you for having us, for having me in the panel. And I promise you that this paper will be put in good use in raising awareness on, on climate change and mental health to save more lives. Maraming salamat po. Oh, thank you so much, Senna. I was particularly pleased that you were able to show that in your practice, some of the observations in this briefing paper will be helpful. Thank you for reminding us that it is vital to carefully consider mental health in disaster responses, both through equipping communities and health systems with material support and enabling people to have the skills to build resilience before disasters occur and then provide support for them 
in the aftermath. And your work with community groups is most impressive, but I think all of us will remember your personal account of your experiences in responding to a very distressed client. Thank you again. And now we shift to our uh, third panelist, Clover Hogan of Force of Nature, uh, and she's where she's executive director. Clover, you have the floor for three minutes now. Thanks, David. Um, so I'd love to kick off with um, a few numbers because I think they, they help give a little context and body to just how prevalent the rise of eco-anxiety and, and mental distress is in response to the climate crisis. So a survey from Friends of the Earth that was conducted last year in 2020 showed that in the UK, over 70% of 18 to 24 year olds were experiencing eco-anxiety. We decided to conduct research on a global scale with our student network in 52 countries. And we found of those 500 young people we surveyed, over 70% of them said that the climate crisis negatively contributed to their mental health. Over 70% said that they felt hopeless in response to the climate crisis. And most critically, and, and what I deem to be most interesting, only 26% of those young people felt that they could meaningfully contribute to solving climate change. Now, in the years that I've been researching eco-anxiety and the role of mindset in mobilizing action for climate change, I have continually encountered two really big misconceptions, particularly around the rise of eco-anxiety. So the first is the narrow view that eco-anxiety only stems from the climate crisis, when in reality, what we've found through countless conversations is that eco-anxiety really stems from perceived inaction in the face of climate change. So particularly for young people looking to the institutions in which we've placed our trust growing up, be that government or business or education, and seeing relative apathy or at least a lack of urgency in response to the climate crisis. And also a real sense um, of not having the skills to really show up, a lack of that personal agency and self-efficacy. So we've seen this show up in two main stories. I'm too small to make a difference and the system is too broken to create meaningful change. Now, the second big misconception we hear all the time is that we should try to fix eco-anxiety. Now, eco-anxiety is a healthy response. For my 10 years of climate action, I tried to wrestle my own eco-anxiety into submission until I realized that those feelings of grief and anxiety and anger were as critical as the feelings of inspiration or empowerment. So we wouldn't want to disallow these feelings in ourselves or those feelings in others. And in fact, every climate psychologist we've spoken to at Force of Nature has argued that the problem isn't that lots of young people feel eco-anxious, but that those in positions of power are not. So we wanna try and create space for those feelings. Now, inevitably, feelings of eco-anxiety can turn into ecophobia or powerlessness. This kind of paralysis when we look at the enormity of the challenge and our smallness in the face of it. And so it is critical as we create space for our eco-anxiety that we also create space for our agency, community, and vision. Thank you. Agency. Lovely. Beautiful. I mean, I, I don't want to, in a way, take the shine off your excellent remarks by feeding them back to you. But I just have to say that I found your identification of these two challenges really important. Eco-anxiety is more than climate. There's a loss of trust in the capacity of the system to respond and the anxiety is more to do with inaction rather than to do with the problem itself. And secondly, uh, that we shouldn't necessarily see ourselves having to fix our eco-anxiety. It is, as you say, a, a healthy phenomenon. Indeed, it's legitimate and what matters is that we are enabled to have the agency required to be able to act. Thank you again, Clover. And now I'd like to go to Jennifer Uchendu, connecting from Lagos, uh, founder of Susti Vibes. Jennifer, you have three minutes starting now. Delighted you're here. Thank you very much, David. And hi, everyone. Very, very pleased to be here connecting from Nigeria. Um, in the past two, three years, I've sort of shifted my focus to this idea of the intersects between mental health and climate change. 
And what I've realized is that it's almost as if we have a different conversation in the global south compared to the global north in the sense that we see this intersection from the eye of climate injustice and the fact that we feel more of a moral injury, particularly young people when they put their future and their current predicament with um, climate change side by side. You know, we feel that it's, it's, it's really unfair that young people have this burden of hope you know to make a change with climate action but at the same time we're left with the reality that this is what we have and this is where we have to push through and from a from a personal point of view being a youth climate activist being very passionate and excited about you know doing work and participating in climate strikes i think i came to the full realization that it can also be disempowering when you realize that the power structures who are you know really empowered to be able to make change don't come to terms with their feelings or the emotional bits of climate change and i guess that's where that disempowerment started to come for me and then looking back to young people in nigeria that i work with there was that sense of you know disconnect how do we go to plant trees and trees are being cut you know next week by government how do we put these two things aside it's the reality that we don't just need that political will for climate action it also needs to be backed by an emotional sort of empathy. Our leaders need to realize that this is an important, this is a fight for our future. And this is how resilience sort of comes about. And then sort of wrapping it up, I believe this is, this is how we now need to move and live with climate change. This is what climate adaptation looks like recognizing the significant impact of climate change to our mental health, particularly for children and young people, particularly for people who live in the global south, you know, vulnerable people who are the front lines of climate issues, and then just generally making, making space for conversations like this. Um, when I first got to read the paper, I was excited because I was doing research about equal anxiety, trying to understand why these feelings were so beautiful up and pent up in my life and just finding spaces like this where there's call for policymakers to take this into account call for need for you know a collaborative effort where we need ngos health workers everyone coming together to speak to this crisis i believe this is how climate adaptation needs to be put forward moving on this is how we can live with climate change yeah. thank you jenny thank you again for coming and for speaking clearly and as you say, you are talking very much from the perspective of a young woman from the South in a situation where you are constantly reminded of the injustice around climate change and the sense that it is a, a moral assault. And that if you are in the South, it, it really feels like something that is hard to handle. I mean, so often we expect young people to have hope and excitement about the future. And what you're saying is, it's not just like that, particularly not among the young people with whom you work, that they feel they're up against quite disempowering structures and the need for dialogue, coordination and joint working is now more important than ever. I'm so glad you find the paper helpful. And thank you again for joining us today. Stick around because we've got lots of questions coming in. And now we, we move to Dr. Gary Belkin. Uh, Gary, uh, thank you for joining us from Billion Minds Institute. And we'd love to hear your comments on the paper starting now. Thank you. Gary, I'm just checking. Sorry, I'm here. Oh, uh, yeah. So as someone who works in mental health policy, you know, the earth has increasingly become a kind of psychological wrecking ball. And when we talk about mental health or mental health systems, we need to markedly reimagine, redesign, equip these to not only be able to reach a whole new magnitude of burden of mental illness and emotional suffering, but to also advance other ends, to also protect and promote the overall emotional strength, resilience, and mental health and well being of the population, to diminish conflict and trauma, to advance collective efficacy, social cohesion, and ties. Those ends are interconnected with mental health and together comprise what I've been calling the social climate. 
a robust social climate is necessary for communities to take on the work of enduring and to be able to, and as Emma and Clover described, also benefit from acting, adapting, and innovating through this daunting path of climate and environmental change. Now, our species can be an integral part of sustaining a balanced, regenerative, biodiversity anchored earth climate when we also see our communities in new ways as places that grow balanced, regenerative, diversity dependent, just, humane social climates. The good news is we actually know a lot about the social psychology and prevention science of how to grow nurturing communities, of how to get to robust social climates. But how do we put that knowledge to work? That to me is an engineering problem and I'll offer one potential direction uh, forward if I can have the, the slide. Uh, when I was a deputy health commissioner for New York City, um, I led an effort called Thrive NYC that is depicted on this map, sought to democratize and disperse the task of a population approach to mental health by putting skills for everything from acute distress counseling to early promotion and prevention intervention interventions in the hands of an array of community members and places, non-mental health people largely. This approach, often referred to as task sharing, I learned from the Global South and indebted to that experience. Each dot here is a geocoded space where that kind of work happened, whether by daycare center staff, clergy, teachers, job training counselors, parents, police officers. None of these places were mental health clinics or offices, but they did partner with mental health clinicians who now stepped into a new role to coach and build the skills and capacity of all these other people in places. And relocating and dispersing the work in this way also brought in other sectors as well and other ages, agencies of city government, which are captured in the logos on the left. This re-engineering, this highly intersectional participatory empowering and large scope and ground level physical footprint of the work of mental health in its full ambitious sense could be a sort of infrastructure to build on and help bolster uh, the social climate, but we have to re-engineer our policies and our thinking uh, and our connections to community to move that, uh, to community and justice to move that forward. Gary, thank you. As you were talking, I was thinking just how relevant the re-engineered approach that you have been trying in New York City is for dealing with other issues that are affecting uh, societies. For example, COVID, uh, we've learned over time that local level integrated collective action uh, can enable people who are the solution to dealing with the virus to be more empowered. And, and you've just shown that that approach is absolutely vital when focusing on the resilience of individuals and societies with a different social climate and an ability to act through adaptive, adaptive innovation. Lovely, and what a pity we can't hear more, but our panelists have given us a really good start. And now I want to shift to some of your questions. And what I've done, because we're quite tight on time, is to group your questions. Uh, it means that I won't always be able to say exactly who asked them. But, but I've got four or five groups, and, and I'm going to actually throw the questions open to the panelists, and I'm going to tell them two or three of the question bundles and invite them to just uh, give responses in a collective way. Otherwise, we will just not have time. So the first set of questions and the, the questioner who I would want to identify is Susan Clayton of the College of Worcester, uh, together with uh, others. It's really, what is the best way to prepare as a society for the mental health needs that are associated with climate change? So it's asking you all to take your experiences that have often been quite limited in scope um, and, and that's absolutely how it has to be and just look a little bit more broadly some good strong policy recommendations secondly if we can actually get ourselves better organized to deal with the mental health challenges uh, will that actually give us lots of ex uh, additional assets uh, in our societies that will better enable us to deal with other existential threats and can we actually quantify the benefits of adaptation uh, and resilience? And this comes from David Bracefield of Sunas Rehabilitation. And perhaps the third in this first series of questions is given all that we've been discussing, both in the paper and in your comments, how do 
parents talk to their children about the issue of ecological breakdown or eco-anxiety and how to encourage the behavioural changes in younger people uh, that are needed to respond to climate change without leaving them feeling overwhelmed or even angry that they're being asked to take on the issues that their parents should be dealing with better. So those are some of the questions. They're all about turning all the ideas more into operations. And obviously it's stretching you all, but I'm, I thought I'd just go, go come to you each and, and, and ask you to reflect on operationalization. And in doing so, you just might want to think of one point that Dom uh, Higgins of the Wildlife Trusts and Catherine Hoom also raised, which is about how this work on climate action that we're doing, climate action and mental health, can actually go to delivering solutions perhaps that go more broadly other health crises other work on nature uh, generally are we able to expand and be even more ambitious let me start with our our, our first panelist i'll come to emma lawrence at the end if she doesn't mind but so let me go quickly to uh, katie hayes the sort of questions that i've just given you how do you react to them please katie couple of minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in particular, um, Dr. Susan Clayton, hi, Susan, um, your question about preparing society, I think that's a really important question. And, and my reaction really is, is, you know, thinking about the health sector, which I work in, and, and, and from a policy perspective is really um, making sure that our health professionals are trained and understand the health effects of climate change, you know, physical health effects and the mental health effects. You know, there was a recent study of International Federation students, medical students, and only 15% had been trained in the climate effects on health. So I think in, there's an important role for health professionals to play. Um, so too, I think one of the, the key components in terms of supporting um, and building resilience is building health systems resilience that really considers mental health systems. And when we consider mental health systems, that's also the social infrastructure. And so really considering how that works together and how we as a society intend to build towards those things and really thinking about um, some of the components Emma brought forward in terms of the co-benefits, really taking that lens of how we're looking at mitigation and adaptation that increase the co-benefits to our mental health and well-being. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. And it's very practical, and 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 uh, it seemed to have a, a lot of value, uh, and and at a national level particularly. Now, S Senna, think a bit more about how you would like to see this sort of approach that you described so neatly. How you want to see it taken forward, turned into policy. Wave your magic wand a bit. Sure. Um, well, actually, in my opinion, uh, since we are responding to the calamities and we, are, we can definitely predict that we are receiving like an average of 20 typhoons per year, um, mental health responders should be part of the, dis of the disaster team already. So we should not wait for like three months to respond after, after calamity. We should be we should be an active part of that so that the, in the policy, uh, in the training, we're part of it and on the assessment basically of the victims as well in the area, we can already know or we can already assess what to do next. So if mental health is part of the, um, say, a team of um, disaster risk and reduction team, then we would be able to help out more efficiently on on um on responding to the calamities yeah. do you know that's really great i think that's something that we should all take on board as we walk away from here the mental health members must be not just in the team but part of the first response efforts yes. gosh yes thank you and uh clover I, i'm just really interested to hear from you a bit about how the outreach putting it more into policy, looking ahead a few more years, how you'd like to see this done in practice from your, uh, your perspective of directly working with people who are most at risk. Absolutely. Um, so I think as a starting point, why I love researching mental health and climate change is because it is inherently intersectional. And I think increasingly we appreciate that we can't afford to think about climate change in a silo. We have to look at the mental health impacts. We have to talk about the climate crisis as a social justice crisis. Um, and equally, when we break down those silos, particularly in where conversation happens, we can see really powerful shifts. 
Um, so a lot of the work that we do at Force of Nature is engaging with people in the ecosystem of power. So decision makers across business and policy and education. And what we found is that often when we ask business leaders, for example, why they're in a room, why they're talking about the climate crisis, it isn't because they read an IPCC report from the UN or because they, they read a doomsday article, it's always because their child came home to them at the end of the day and said, mom, dad, what are you doing about the climate crisis? And often from that vulnerability of experiencing that eco-anxiety. So I think focusing on the climate crisis through this lens is a really powerful way to mobilize action in unexpected places. And from my view, we want to see that change happen on a very intersectional level. Yeah. So we want to see it happening in the way that we teach climate change, right? It's not enough to just equip young people with the knowledge and research and facts. We yeah. have to teach climate change in a way that cultivates agency. And the same is true across policy. The same is true in the way that businesses communicate the actions that they are taking for climate change. Um, so that's a spaghetti on the wall response. <laughs> Thank you so much, Scott. Listen to the children when they're anxious, don't dismiss and deny. It's important that we teach in a way that encourages agency, stress the social justice implications of climate change, and don't be scared to engage in the power system. Thank you. Very valuable guidance. Now, let's move on to um, hear from uh, uh, Gary, please. Uh, sorry, Jennifer, please. Jennifer, we, you've, I've given you a set of rather general issues that I want to reflect on, but I'm in your case, I really want you to give us a little bit more on how you believe governments and local authorities can really take this issue on board and give it just that much more uh, direction and exposure. Over to you, Jennifer. Thank you very much, David. And I mean, just to re-echo a lot of what Clover says, I mean, we, we look at this issue very much from a youth perspective, child and children and young people's perspective. It's that idea of, you know, shifting power and the discourse, particularly, I mean, if, if we're, we're talking about how climate change impacts our feelings, then we should be giving space to talk about those feelings and how what solutions look like. You know, gone are the days where, you know, recommendations are pushed towards young people or communities without their permission or without their ideas being placed um, or incorporated into this idea. So for me, looking forward, what hope or solutions look like is discusses where vulnerable communities are part of policy making and solution gathering where the experiences of frontliners are placed within policy you know it becomes it becomes real it becomes validated where we're not of course pathologizing um equal anxiety in young people but we're giving it space space where it can be used for us to usher new thinking of what climate adaptation would look like and then secondly just within in that intersect of climate change and mental health, we can't take away the social justice beat of it. The fact that these conversations need to happen within the framework of, you know, the lenses of who who's suffering the most, you know, how marginally displaced are people within the climate crisis, and then just bringing it all together where inclusion is really, really felt. That idea right. of inclusion has been missing for the longest. So inclusion for me would be a way forward where all voices matter and um, they are brought forward towards policy making. Thank you. So thank you so much, Jenny. Inclusive spaces where people feel that they can safely share, have dialogue, and not be seen to be pathological, but to be given the recognition and the agency. Thanks again, Jennifer, and always thanks for what you do and the, your own courage in this area. To Gary. Gary, if we're in a way all coming back to many of the issues that you worked on in your experience in, in New York City, but could you give us a little bit more, having heard how we're all reacting to the challenge of building out this way of thinking and working, what would your two or three bits of your very precise advice you'd like to give us? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really struck by Susan Home. Hello, Susan. As a you know, opening question, you know, how do we prepare the public? We're not preparing the public. Uh, so the first thing is to be honest uh, with the public about this dimension of the process of the problem, uh, that there is distress here and there's a way more to come. Um, and then to act like it, you know, David, you brought up the analogy with uh, my, you know, the challenges of COVID are really that largely outsized and really need full participation of communities. Um, we haven't brought on that full participation and we're not being honest about it. I mean, the U.S. data is that 40% or more of uh, U.S. adults rule in on surveys for um, clinical depression and anxiety. We're not talking about that and we're certainly not acting like we, that we, that we are, have our heads wrapped around that reality. Um, uh, so we have to respect people for the frontline um, uh, workers that they are, especially in doing the work and doing the ground game uh, of culture change and climate adaptation and emotional resilience and social resilience building. They're the workforce. And so we have to support them to be that workforce. Um, and that means really changing our systems, how we right. engage uh, uh, communities and see this as uh, work that has to be place-based and, and address the moral injuries, as Jennifer put it, that drive disparities for a range of problems that we're empowering mm. people to work on. Thanks very much indeed, Gary. Emma, I'm going to come to you. You've heard the panel, you presented your report, and I want to ask you, what are the things that you would like to be really leading on as you move forward with this? We haven't got a super long time. So it's your chance to really try to develop a summary. And then uh, after you've spoken, then we'll terminate the session, end the session. Emma. Many thanks, David. Um, I'll try and be brief. So we've heard that across all levels of all societies globally, we need to make sure that we're in adapting and mitigating to the effects of climate change that we're considering mental health as a, as a central part of that in, in policy and planning. And in order to do that, we need to raise awareness, which we hope today is part of, but I encourage you all in whatever organization and sector you're in um, to speak out. And we, we thank you so much for coming um, and to read the briefing paper to learn more. Um, and in terms of then how to take that awareness into action, what actions do we need across society? Well, we've heard some of those today um, but we need to come together across organizations and sectors to really learn more because there are good examples of, of practice as Sina and Gary and Clover and Jennifer and Katie have all spoken to that we can learn from and the recommendations in the briefing paper. And we need to bring in the voices of those most affected um, as well as, as, as the expertise across sectors as this systems level problem. Um, and we need to target future research into key areas. So I encourage you all to, to speak out and, and hopefully to continue to work together. Um, and I'll pass back to you, David. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. This has been a, a whistle stop session with a really good presentation of for what I believe to be one of the most important pieces of work on climate action that I've seen in recent years. I congratulate the team behind the work and of course, all who are involved in preparing today's discussion around the paper. But I especially want to thank our panelists. You've all heard the absolute care and clarity with which they have reacted to the paper. And most importantly, you've heard some very precise and extremely helpful suggestions as to how we can take this work forward inside our families, in our communities, in our schools, in our workplaces, in healthcare and in other forms of practice. Do access the recording of this and listen very carefully to some of the panelists' remarks, both when they spoke at the beginning and when they responded to the composite questions. And most importantly, stay involved. This is work that is going to evolve. It's clearly extremely important and it, and, and it could well be an issue on which careful action now that takes account of the many issues around justice, around community organisers, engagement and respect that you heard from our panellists, that that what is what's going to make a difference. And we all have a chance. We have a chance. And the more we do now, the better the situation will be in the months 
years and decades to come. Uh, just I've got to just say a couple of things before we close. Um, I, I don't know whether there are any more, uh, I don't think I have any more uh, um, slides to show, but I would like to again remind you that there is a recording that will be shared. Please do check out the briefing paper and please complete an evaluation form that's going to be made available uh, to share your reflections on what you'd like us to do next. Thank you again, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to panelists. Here's here's your here's your poll, and this is what we'd love you to fill in. Uh, if we can just stay on just a moment longer, just do fill in this poll, and we'll make sure that the replies are available uh, when we circulate uh, the with the details of the recording. So fill it in. I'm filling it in now. Uh, you can do multiple choice answers to this question. So this, I think, is, is helpful because you can, if you want to, tick all the boxes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Emma, I think it's three minutes past, so I think I've probably got to close. Uh, if, that, if that's okay by you, that's what I'm gonna do. Great, thank you very much, David, and thank you for your excellent um, chairing and to all panelists, we really appreciate all the wonderful insights you've shared and to everyone for attending, many, many thanks. Oh, here's the results. Aren't you good? With that, bye-bye all. Thank you. Very good. All the panelists, if you're bye, still everyone. on. Yeah, that was just great, the panel. And bye to all those who participated. And wonderful questions coming in yeah. from the audience. Aren't they good? Well. Aren't they good? We had too many. We couldn't possibly answer them all. But we'll put them all. We'll keep them as a as an inspiration to us for the future. Okay. Emma, thank the team. Bye-bye.